First of all, thanks, thanks, Joe, to you and the board for, for putting this apps and this topic uh, that's so important in women's health on the agenda. And Ariana, thanks to you and the staff. This has just been amazing. Thank you. And thank you, Kristen. Um, you folks will get to meet her in just a bit. Uh, she'll be on the panel. I think everybody who hears Kristen's story cannot help but be touched by the near-death experience and the agonizing course of her second pregnancy. For months, she was denied her role as a new mother and wife, hospitalized, not at home with her husband and her newborn child and her first child. And then came that fateful day of that emergency surgery where she was facing the menace of a retained placenta attached to her vital organs and being taken to a room filled with all those special surgeons and nurses. And she faced the real challenge that she may not ever wake up again and see her loved ones. Unfortunately, when you practice as long as I have, you realize that the, you have the burden of seeing similar stories and tragedies. And what makes Kristen's story so moving is that, in a sense, Kristen is a victim of modern medicine, not something such as cancer or hypertension or infections, things that have plagued human childbirth for millenniums. Unfortunately, on our current modern medicine path, stories such as Kristen will increase in frequency. Just 20 years ago, if I had asked a room full of obstetrician gynecologists if they had seen a placenta accreta or a percreta, an occasional hand would have, would have risen. Mo most in the room would be scratching their head going down, accreta, that's, that's where it eats through the... Um, they had never faced one in their practice, and they re really had just heard about it in their, their training. So today when I give lectures on cesarean section in similar rooms, I ask that same question and nearly half of the room will raise their hand that they've seen such an event in the last year in their institution. We even have specialized medical centers that treat and manage these uh, conditions. Statistical analysis has documented the epidemic rise in cesarean hysterectomy and the overwhelming indication for the surgery is these placental abnormalities. Now, maternal mortality has always been a tragic event because in every case it happens to someone's mother, someone's spouse or partner, someone's daughter or someone's granddaughter. But it's also a mortal event for the family unit, and the scars it leaves last lifetimes. Of note, as many have, have raised, we as caregivers are also changed, often leading to depression, suicide, and oftentimes ending people's career. Sadly, maternal mortality is one of the metrics we used to trumpet in our specialty. Uh, for decades, it had declined as the improvements in our tools and techniques had, re had reduced such deaths. In fact, between 1900 and 2000, the rate of maternal mortality fell from 850 per 100,000 to less than 10 per 100,000. By the year 2000, the focus of our safety and outcomes in developed nations had really moved to fetal and neonatal outcomes. And in underdeveloped countries where nutritional or sanitation problems or medical infrastructure prevented it, uh, we were working hard to, to increase appropriate time C-sections. Now, in fact, in, in my home in Orange County, <laughs> we turned our debate to to important things like uh, water births and working with patients who were too posh to push, who were requesting elective cesarean del deliveries. Now, in the meantime, insidiously, the rates of maternal mortality in developed nations began to nadir and slowly rise. In the most recent data, 
in the United States. We even have states that have now risen some four to five times up, back up to 30 to 40 per 100,000. And by the way, to give you an idea of what risk that is, if you compare that to the general population and, and look at things that uh, harm or kill uh, folks, that would trail only behind cancer and heart disease as a cause of death. So what was so different in developed nations to explain this rise in death? Technology, medical support, uh, things such as anesthesia and intensive care, those have all continued to improve. There are basically three differences about our patients in 2018 compared to 1998. First, they're more mature. That's the proper way to say they're older. Um, and that's a result of socioeconomic lifestyle changes uh, with delayed childbearing and improvements in infertility therapy that have allowed women to extend their reproductive careers. Second, they weigh more. And obstetrics were not immune from the obesity epidemic. And thirdly, like Kristen, they're more likely to arrive at labor and delivery with the history of a prior cesarean section. The last factor is a result of rising rates of cesarean section secondary occasionally to medical factors such as age and obesity, but mostly by concerns from patients and providers to worry more about things such as timing the delivery or medical legal concerns. Now, don't misunderstand my message. When necessary, cesarean section can be absolutely life-saving uh, for the mother and the baby. However, when not necessary or avoidable because of our management, these results uh, increase short-term uh, morbidity and mortality, numerically small, but more important, such as Kristen's case uh, exemplifies, there's this exponential rise in risk in subsequent pregnancies. Indeed, avoidable cesarean section in the first pregnancy deprives women of the safest delivery there is. That is, a woman delivering with a prior vaginal delivery. Now, fortunately, there's hope for this epidemic. First, we have the ability to follow our outcome data much, much better now. And we can look at the trends, and we can highlight this, and as, as was mentioned in the video, it's clearly become a safety issue. Second, we have real success stories, and we can point to simple techniques which can lower rates. In my, mo in my own experience, we, we achieve success in one of the highest uh, rates area of the country in, in Orange County. In 1988, at Saddleback Women's Hospital, we had a total cesarean section rate of 31.8%. At the time, that was 5 to 10% higher than the national average. Within four years, we cut that rate in half. And this was 5 to 10% below the national average. The outcome was we avoided hundreds of cesarean sections per year, we had absolutely no quantifiable harm to the mothers and babies. Our story even made the NBC Today show. When Dr. Art Uline, their medical reporter at the time, proclaimed, if you are going to have a baby, this is the kind of people and the kind of hospital you want taking care of you and your baby. Trust me, you could not buy that PR for any amount of money. Uh, combined with other folks' story, we clearly showed that we could lower cesarean section rates. But unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, such efforts in the 90s did not last. And, and really, unfortunately, began to rise again. Now, I just checked our California data. In the last six months, we're down to having only one-third of our hospitals 
above the 23.9 low risk cesarean section rate national goal. And the reason that's amazing is, is that if you looked at the 2014 data in a similar time period, two thirds of California hospitals uh, would have been above that rate. So that means, given our size, 240 hospitals in California, 80 to 90 institutions have lowered their cesarean section rate over that time period. So success is, is clearly possible today, and given the other factors that have happened, we can overcome those. Now we know that most, uh, if you analyze most avoidable cesarean sections are performed by well-meaning and compassionate providers. Unfortunately, they practice in a manner which seems the easiest thing to do at the time is to do a C-section, uh, and that's the best for the mother and the baby. But what we have, have done, however, by recognizing the big picture is developed uh, methods uh, which lessen the likelihood of cesarean section and still afford safe and memorable uh, deliveries. This afternoon, our panel is going to describe an apps with common sense solutions preventing and responding to the most frequent problems that can encounter, we can en encounter and lead to cesarean sections. These are multidisciplinary practice standards and changes outlined by provider organizations such as the ACOG, the Royal College of OBGYN, the Nurses Association, Midwife Associations, et cetera. And published toolkits like the one the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative published that was assembled by thoughtful experts. As you'll see in our app, success requires involvement of patients, families, delivering providers, supporting nursing per personnel, doulas, and educators who sincerely want to improve the lives of mothers and babies and prevent the terrible complications of unnecessary cesarean section. So like you, I was touched when I first heard Kristen's story. Believe it or not, we physicians sometimes can be human. But let me confess my other feelings as an obstetrician. Fear and anger. Fear because it brought back the memories when it was my turn to be standing next to that operating table with the patient laying there with the placenta previa, knowing that all my skills and all my knowledge and all my prayers may not be enough to save that young mother's life. And anger, because as you see upon further discussion, Kristen could have had a procedure called breech version in the first pregnancy. Unfortunately, however, breech version is not readily available in many hospitals. Like so many useful practices that are une unevenly available, in medicine due to the variability of training and expertise. About 50% of the time in patients like Kristen, the cesarean section would have been avoided by safely turning the baby from the outside before labor had begun and giving a high chance of successful vaginal delivery. The story you heard in all likelihood would not have happened at all at least not to Kristen and her precious family. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to describe measures and methods of avoiding unnecessary cesarean delivery and ask that everyone in every setting performing deliveries adopt such practices. So let me bring out an amazing group of experts that can explain and describe our apps uh, that we believe if adopted could prevent these tragedies. Please listen and engage with these caring folks about this critical part of the patient safety movement. Thank you.
welcome. And I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. And Jill, why don't, why don't you start off? Hi, I'm Jill Arnold, and I'm a patient advocate and the co-founder of the National Lakrita Foundation. Hi, I'm Siddharth Satish. Uh, I'm a, an engineer by training. I founded a company called Gauss Surgical. We're focused on using AI to help make delivery and surgery safer. My name is Bob Silver, and I'm an obstetrician at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I'm Kristen Trelitzi, co-founder of the National Creative Foundation, and Dr. Legru did a great job augmenting my video about my story. Um, in my second pregnancy, my son's placenta attached over the prior cesarean scar in my uterus, and that's what caused me to develop placenta procreta. And I am so grateful for the incredible medical team that delivered my son safely and saved my life twice, actually. <laughs> And I'm honored to be here today to help illustrate the downstream risks of a cesarean. Now, now we may look very American to you, but let me just reassure you this is an international panel because <laughs> a couple of us are from the Republic of California. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's start things off, though, to look at that with, with you, Bob. And... and I know you've worked with colleagues um, throughout the world in, in your studies and your travels and, and in your research. What's your international uh, perspective on uh, the variance between different cesarean section rates? Um, obviously, today we're seeing a problem of too high a rates in developed nations and then still in underdeveloped nations, too low a rates. Um, is there a just right rate or what is, where are we? Well, that, that's certainly a great question, and, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. Firstly, uh, let me just say, especially uh, if there are any young women in the crowd who are planning on having a baby, um, pregnancy is a normal physiologic event. It's not a disease, uh, and most people live and don't have to be hospitalized, so don't be afraid to get pregnant. Um, <laughs> and and uh, cesarean delivery is, is really a great thing in many cases, and it, it can save lives of mothers and babies. And it has had a tremendously favorable impact on, on uh, childbirth uh, for, for the last hundred years. So all cesareans are not bad, and in fact it can be really life-saving. But unnecessary cesareans are bad, and that's the message that, that we want to deliver. And it's, it's hard to say exactly what those should be. Now, placenta accreta is the, the major risk of cesareans and subsequent pregnancies. But like any unnecessary operation, and that's what, what this is, is unnecessary operations, there are risks. And, and if you do enough of them, you'll have anesthesia complications, you'll have blood clots, you'll have hemorrhage, you'll have um, infections. Uh, and if you do enough of them, you'll have unnecessary deaths and unnecessary seriously ill people. So what we want to do is eliminate unnecessary cesareans. There's really no one-size-fits-all uh, optimal number of cesareans. And people have asked this question, um, and, and sometimes we'll just kind of make up a number. Um, but it's, it's hard to say exactly. And in many low-resource settings, where it's hard to get to a hospital and you don't have the resources of a surgeon or anesthesia, cesarean rates are way too low. And if we did more of them, you would really save mothers' lives and babies' lives. But in high-resource countries, um, the rates are too high. So on balance, um, a, a, a number that's considered reasonable is somewhere between 15 to 25 percent and probably 15 to 20 percent. And uh, that's a little bit made up, but it's based on uh, modeling. If you model the best outcomes for moms and the best outcomes for babies in high-resource settings, that's the number you'd expect. There's incredible variation in the actual numbers. In the United States, the rate of cesarean is about 32%. But if you go state by state, and I'm proud of this because I'm in Utah, which has the lowest rate, it's 22%. But in the highest state, it's 38%. Here in the UK, the rate is about 26%. But in Europe, it ranges from a low of 17% in Sweden to a high of 50% in Cyprus. So that range is due to individual practice patterns. So uh, 
really great question. The best answer I can give you is 15 to 20 percent, recognizing that that's an estimate. Thanks. Let, let's focus on, on the view of the problem. Kristen, I'm going I'm to start with you. I mean, because you've been out telling your story, uh, interacting with folks. Do you think the message is getting through? I think there's really two different camps of providers. I think there's providers like Dr. Silver who are treating the accretas who are acutely aware of the patient safety impact of our cesarean epidemic. But I think that there's also providers who aren't seeing it and who think that the cesarean reduction measures are more of a cost savings or a nice to have and they just don't see the urgency there. And that's where my story can make a big difference. We know that data is what brings improvement in healthcare, but it's really the patient stories that help show what the reality of that data is to the patients and the families that are affected by these issues. And while telling my story, I, I want to make clear that a cesarean can be a life-saving intervention, but it is also a trade-off of current risk for future risk. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing different about this safety aspect is that the, the time difference between the event that actually caused it and the actual bad outcome. And I think a lot of clinicians do not make that, that tie. Bob, you've, you've uh, obviously you're in the midst of a lot of the national work and research, uh, the recent ARRIVE trial that talked about elective inductions and, and how that's going to be, uh, how that could impact or lower C-section rates. Um, that's balanced against our number of our current recommendations, in, including those in the apps that limit inductions and things of that nature. How do you see that being reconciled? How, how do you compare those, the recommendations sort of non-intervention versus, versus uh, elective induction? You bet. So this is, uh, this is a really exciting, exciting study that's just been completed. Uh, the results have been presented, but they haven't been published yet, so I can only talk a, a little bit about the results. Um, just for, for the audience in, in the big picture, um, because there's such a range in cesarean delivery rates, it's clearly due to behavior of obstetricians, of practitioners. And so how to change that behavior to lower the cesarean rate and to have there be fewer unnecessary cesareans is really the challenge. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. So the ARRIVE trial is a study that compared elective induction uh, of low-risk women, people who, who were very healthy otherwise, having their first pregnancies at 39 weeks gestation, so induction of labor versus just normal care, which would be to continue the pregnancy. And the derivation for the trial was twofold. We know that the later you go in pregnancy, if you go past 39 weeks, um, there's a very slight but real increase in the risk of bad things happening to moms and babies. The further out you get, the more likely you are to have a stillbirth, the more likely you are to have a sick baby, the more likely you are to have a sick mom. Those risks are low, but, but they're, they're there. And the reason that people didn't want to just deliver everybody at 39 weeks is because we thought that that would really increase the cesarean rate. And we've known for a long time that if you induce someone's labor and you compare the rate of cesarean compared to somebody who goes into spontaneous labor, that the induction will increase their chances of a cesarean by about twofold. And in, in fact, when I was training a long time ago, um, we were taught it's really bad to induce people, that you're causing harm, that you're going to increase the cesarean rate. Uh, and that's what we've, we've taught historically. But it turns out that's really a flawed comparison because when someone comes in to see you in your office, you can't will them into spontaneous labor. That's not a choice that you have. Your choice is to induce labor or to wait, to do what we call expectant management and see what happens. And some of those patients will go into labor in a week, but some of those patients will never go into labor, and you'll have to induce them two weeks later. And maybe the placenta won't work as well, and maybe the baby will be bigger, and you'll actually have an increased rate of cesarean. So in, in poorly designed studies, when we tried to, to look backwards and compare induction of labor 
to expectant management, induction of labor didn't seem to increase the cesarean rate, and it actually seemed to decrease it. So the study that was done was to, to randomize 3,000 patients to induction versus expectant management, and it turned out there was a, a small um, but real reduction in adverse events for mom and baby, and a meaningful reduction in the cesarean rate in the people who were induced. So we're really excited about that, and it really is a paradigm shift. It really causes us to have to unlearn a lot of the things that we learn. It's only one study. It was a very, very selected group of women. By no means does it mean that we should induce everybody at 39 weeks, <laughs> but it gives us another tool in the toolbox and something that we ought to study that may help us to lower the cesarean rate. Great. No, I, I think it's an exciting development, and it just shows the need for further uh, research. Jill, I'm going to switch to you. Now, you've worked with Kristen and heard a lot of stories about accretas, you know, through your work. Um, are, are providers and patients aligned on this? Um, are patients asking the right questions? questions and getting educated? Well, I think that, um, as always, certain patients with higher health literacy are probably asking, we're always asking the questions, you know, who we are. <laughs> um, and I do think that with, you know, all of the campaigns that we've done in recent years um, to, you know, raise awareness for high C-section rates, I think people are, I would posit that they probably are asking more questions about, you know, asking you directly, what is your C-section rate? Um, but I do think there are people that are more comfortable in a healthcare setting. And I do want to take the time to say that, uh, you know, in any discussion of childbirth, I think it's important to point out that in the U.S., black women um, are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than their white counterparts. And so I just like to bring that up that, you know, when it t we talk about comfort in a medical setting and feeling safe, um, that's an important issue to address. But, you know, one of the challenges as far as, you know, I think you can have the most, you know, an incredibly robust conversation in your prenatal visits with your doctor, but, um, you know, we have, in, among hospitals, we have tenfold variation in C-section rates. And it goes so far beyond just like a, you know, strategic regionalization of care where you have certain hospitals picking up, you know, like the complicated cases, so they have a higher rate. Um, it's just all over the map. And it's actually, you know, it, um, the hospital itself and the way that labor is managed is an independent risk factor for cesarean birth which is, you know, um, pretty significant. So, um, you know, if you're going to have an uphill battle at Hospital A that you wouldn't have at Hospital B, does it really matter what questions you ask your doctor? <laughs> but, you know, now that I've actually, I've, I've painted, painted a pretty bleak peak picture, I think. Um, one of the things we're working on at, um, in my day job as a consultant at Consumer Reports with CMQCC, the organization you mentioned, and California Healthcare Foundation, is creating a suite of patient education materials based on qualitative research that really do, so that alignment is possible. Like, I'm not being totally negative. The, I think that alignment between provider and patient and the questions asked is possible, and there are steps that patients can take. Yeah, and I just want to pile on a little bit because you talked about the variation hospital to hospital. Part of my work has led me to look at literally hundreds of hospitals and drill down and what you see is actually that same variance within the hospital between the different providers now some of that you can explain by attribution and different things but there's clearly not only variance with hospital to hospital but variance from provider to provider so it's it's something that's a real challenge uh, for us Sid, now you've done most of your work on using AI and big data on, on blood loss as, as part of your, your day job. Um, but uh, pretty much as the world of obstetrics through the EMR, through our data in the fetal heart rate, ultrasound, et cetera, becomes digitized, we're, we're being now having access to huge amounts of data. How can we use AI and, and big data to help us uh, reduce unnecessary C-sections? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I accidentally, I would say, discovered this problem. Um, we were mentioned in the same article around uh, maternal mortality and, and placenta creta. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me is, is our organization started to look at postpartum hemorrhage as the area we were focusing on was this incredible variance in C-section rates um, across the country in different states, different hospitals being 
the, the, the key difference, uh, the, the key you know, decision point for whether or not a rate was high or low. And I think the first thing that it really ought to be called out is the data itself. Just having the data as openly as it's been in California, specifically with the CMQCC's maternal you know, data center, that itself I know has triggered a change. Um, you know, physicians uh, certainly uh, you know, look at their experience and they know kind of what happened in the last 10 cases they did, uh, but, but certainly you know, while we can talk about it at the population level, uh, a specific physician may not really know what their own C-section sort of rate is. So having this data come out, having physicians start, start looking at it, um, caused a big change. It caused a big change because people don't want to be outliers. Um, but I think it goes a step further to your question about AI and data as we've thought about just the work we've done uh, in the digital space. Um, and I think the answer really comes down to, this reminds me a lot of a very parallel topic of blood management and you know, prevention of unnecessary blood transfusion. It's, it's really a diagnostic question with a lot of variability in, in you know, practice patterns, the risk factors, um, things like the, the time of labor being a determinant in, in you know, whether a C-section is, is performed or not. And I think that the role data could play and the role that AI can play is, is significant. Um, the reason being that we can employ data, which there's a lot of it, there's a lot of data available, uh, we can then you know, take algorithms that have been significantly developed to date uh, and, and attach them to that data. And we can then, I think, essentially predict the appropriateness levels of medical interventions, in this case, C-sections. Do we really need to perform a C-section and does the data objectively with interoperable data from you know, many different devices really support the conclusion that a C-section is necessary? And then we leave it up to the physician to communicate that to the patient and for the patient to, to make a choice, which I think is, is, is key. But I think AI, look, we have self-driving cars and they're using deep learning, uh, which is a very advanced form of machine learning and more broadly AI. Um, helping us do those types of things. We use AI to predict what movies to watch. Why can't we use AI to analyze medical data in real time and to have a self-learning system that can make delivery safer and really help us understand if a C-section is necessary uh, before performing it? Great, absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Okay, rapid, rapid response time. Okay, I wanna jump to the apps. And I'm going to ask each of you, what's your favorite part of the apps? Okay? Kristen. First off, I love that the patient perspective was included in the creation of the apps. I think that is so important to quality improvement to include those who have been personally affected by these problems in identifying the solutions. But as for the text of the APSS, my favorite part was the focus of educating patients on the long-term risks of a cesarean. I think we do a very good job of educating on the short-term risks, but in the Akrita community, we have this saying that placenta Akrita is that future life-threatening risk of a cesarean that no one ever told you about. And too often, the first time women hear the word Akrita is in the doctor's office when they're diagnosed with it, <laughs> myself included. Yeah. Thanks. Bob. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that, that uh, uh, I'm not going to choose a single part of it. Uh, I think the most important thing is just trying to pay attention and just using it and trying to lower the cesarean rate. And I think that th there's no single part of it that's magical or a key ingredient. I think the entire thing together and more the, just, just wanting to, you know, just as a culture, as clinicians, as institutions, as nations, deciding we're gonna lower the cesarean rate. Almost anything that we do is gonna result in a positive change. Um, so the, the entire package together and the effort is more important than any individual component. Yeah, I, I think this is where it aligns with other safety measures. It's, it's uh, just standardization and reducing the variance <laughs> of what we do and working better as a team, that can uh, uh, agree. Sid? I think, actually, on that note, standardization, um, what really spoke to me was device interoperability and having the data 
um, all accessible and in the same place as sort of a universal source of truth. And the reason that's important is that, I think, is ultimately what allows for more standardized decision making and also then opens the potential for you know, these, these aforementioned AIs that can effectively take that data and, um, and, and provide real-time clinical decision support. But it, we can't go anywhere without the data and having the data sort of in one form talking to each other, um, which I think is key. Jill? So I think I, overall I like that it was a, you know, it's a low cost, low burden solution. I, I look at things and I think, are they scalable? And are they affordable? Because I know in Arkansas, where I live, we have a lot of critical access hospitals and rural hospitals that offer maternity services. And this is something that a motivated QI team without, you know, they could leverage existing IT resources, don't need to hire anyone, don't need to, you know, get special fancy software or anything. It's something that they could implement if they feel motivated to do so. Nurses could step up and, and do this. So I think that's my favorite part. Great. So um, let let me go back a little bit because I think, uh, Bob, our discussion early raised this tension between interventionalist or uh, in the old days it would have been active management of labor against patients, 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 or what today would be natural uh, uh, childbirth and, and more physiologic approaches. Um, what are your thoughts? Can we have both? I mean, you know, as a quality improvement specialist, I'm all, all about, as we talked about, standardizing and reducing variation. But I think it seems that certainly labor techniques and things of that nature do have to be individualized to what the patient wants. What, what are your thoughts on that? You bet. I think that's, that, that's really well said. And, you know, pregnancy and having a baby is really a, a different part of medicine. You know, if you, if you have a heart attack or cancer, you just want to get better. And if you break a bone, you want to get better and you want to be able to use your, your limb. Uh, when you have a baby, you want to have a really healthy mom, you want a really healthy baby, and you want to have this wonderful experience. Um, and every family has a very different conception of what that wonderful experience is. Uh, and, and pretty much as, as healthcare systems, we ought to be willing to provide that experience as long as it doesn't cause harm. And, and so it's, it's very different than some other areas of medicine. And also, there are certain things that, that it's hard to make a mathematical formula for. You know, if, if certain things are really harmful, and you would recommend don't do that. But if there are tiny differences or really small risk differences, then patient preference is really important. And so as we decide what to do, number one, it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. And number two is more and more we have to have patient-centered outcomes uh, and really work with families to see what they want. So I do think it's possible uh, to, to be natural and holistic and also uh, use interventions. Um, I pride myself on doing that personally. I'm a high-risk obstetrician, so I take care of a lot of very sick patients who need a lot of major interventions. But I also am passionate about vaginal birth. And I have a large group of families who see me because they really want to have a holistic, non-interventional experience. And so I've been nicknamed the perinatal midwife because I do a lot of very low-risk, touchy-feely kinds of things. But I also do some of the most high-risk interventions. Pregnancy is a normal physiologic event. And most patients would do just terrific if we, if we didn't intervene or meddle or, or overutilize uh, interventions. And if things are going well, I think being hands-off and, and natural is the best thing that we could do. But if things aren't going well, and we have really good and safe interventions that can help moms and babies, we shouldn't be afraid to use them. And I think where we fall down is sometimes physicians especially are too quick to use interventions, even when they're not needed, and sometimes families and, and other clinicians are too resistant to those interventions even when they are needed. And so I think we have to be open-minded and honest about the data, work with families to provide the experience that they want, and, and do both of those things. Yeah, I think that's why involvement in, of, of the patient in the decision process is such a big part of the apps. Jill, you, you've been around this debate. 
you, you've watched the doctors and the nurses and the tension in the room. What, what's, what say you? So, <laughs> well, pretty much what Dr. Silver said, all of that. Um, you know, one of the things that, I mean, pregnancy is a very preference sensitive condition. Um, and I think one of the things that I like about kind of what we're doing is it does find that middle ground. Um, I'm not sure if this is a popular answer, but I, you know, among kind of like the natural birth crowd and stuff, but I think that allowing birth to happen naturally or however, as long as it's safe in a hospital, is probably that middle ground. And, there, you know, there's a term that um, you've probably heard midwives and doulas use for it, holding the space. You've heard this. The idea is it's you're holding the space for the woman to have her birth happen the way she wants it to. And I feel like the neat thing about this app is that it uses data to kind of quantify, is your hospital holding the space for these women? Kristen, your view is a patient. I was speaking to an MFM recently about the recent surge in accreta rates, and he referred to it as Mother Nature's revenge for our increased cesarean rates. And I thought that was a really interesting way to think about it. But one of the things that really fascinates me about my story is that a cesarean tried to kill me, but then the only reason my son Leo and I survived that pregnancy is because a cesarean was available to us. If I had gone into labor without a cesarean available, we both would have died. Right. So I think that that shows very well the power of a cesarean and intervention in general on both sides. Right. I, I think it gets back to the individualization that you raised, Bob, that we have to look, you know, it's not one size fits all. Sid, so how do we balance? We, we have folks that want natural childbirth, non-intervention. How does that sync up with big data and AI and devices and, and all sorts of things. Yeah, I don't think it's actually as complicated as an AI for, for that purpose. I think it's just communication and, and having the data at one's fingertips. I think choice is a really important factor here on the patient's part. And I think what better way it, you know, for a patient to exercise you know, their choice than to be super connected to the body of information the recommendations, guidelines, and, and best practices, um, but also then to be able to communicate that with other patients or to read about other patients' experiences. So whether that's just media or social media or whether that's you know the medical literature. So I think having um, recommendations, as, as I think the apps do, around you know the use of handheld tools and mobile devices as a communication tool for that information, um, that's a key part of really, I think, democratizing the information and, and giving sort of choice you know, to the patient. Great, great. Okay, very quick response. What's the biggest barrier to getting this apps through? Kristen. I think that we tend to think of birth as this isolated event, when in reality it's a moment across a woman's reproductive life. And the culture change that I would like to see in obstetrics is really a focus on that shared decision making across that entire scope. Bob, what's the biggest barrier? I think the biggest problem we have is we haven't aligned the incentives for, for uh, providers with the behaviors that we would like to have. And people can make more money uh, in less time with less fear uh, if they do the behaviors that we don't want them to do. And I think if we want to push their behaviors we have to align their incentives to, with the behaviors that we want. Well put. Sid. So I'll give the, uh, the technology answer, which is that I think the two big barriers are, you know, one is having the data in the same place as we discussed earlier and, and being able to access it and, and do interesting things with the data to help you know, create clinical decision support. And I think the bigger, more broad barrier is just clinical adoption of new technologies, uh, especially when they go sort of head to head with conventional decision making. Um, so at a point at which physicians can be very open to uh, new technologies helping uh, them make better decisions, um, I think that takes a while, but, it, but it's the, the place to go. Jill? Well, I think one of the barriers is not patients. I think a lot of patients sometimes get blamed, although Dr. Silver um, was, uh, I think we're kind of aligned on this. Um, what's, we can look at what's already worked 
as far as lowering C-section rates, and that has been, like in Arkansas, for example, um, Arkansas Medicaid implemented a pay for performance. They got away from fee for service, and they dropped their rate over three years from 28 to their lowest rate from uh, 28 to 24. Like, and they knew, no consumer engagement, no patient engagement, no special steps for patients to take. And the same with your pilots in Southern California, and the same. And, and so it's just, um, I think it really is that provider re-education, the data feedback, and uh, transparency. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to yesterday's discussion about leadership and tag on to that, that clearly it takes from all the disciplines uh, good leaders, but I would add to it passionate leaders. I, I think this is one area of change that because of the time difference, because it's not right in your face that harm occurred, you, you really need to have a different type of, of leadership with that. Now, I, I want to include everyone's uh, question, but there's huge numbers uh, Glad to see you're engaged. Thank you very much. Um, start off with multiple questions on VBAC. Now, and I should say that the apps, like many of the national focuses uh, and international focuses, have worked on first C-sections. But uh, I'll ask the panel, whoever wants to jump in, is there a role for uh, VBACs in, in, in preventing unnecessary C-sections? Absolutely. Um, one of the data points that shocked me when I learned it is once a woman has a prior cesarean in the United States, she has a 90% chance of having a repeat cesarean. And it's these women with multiple cesareans who end up at significant risk of developing an accreta, yet no one else tells <coughs> them that. Bob? You bet. It's, it's, it's a really good example of, of surgeries that are done um, in large part be because of a one in a thousand risk and, and we're probably causing more harm than good uh, by not doing more, more vaginal birth after cesarean. And uh, you know certainly the best way to prevent uh, cretas is to not do that first cesarean, but not doing the second or third one really helps as well. Jill said. I, so we have a measurement gap, if you know, we, don't, we have a, a gap. So about 600,000, or I think it's 604,000 approximately. Um, so about 15% of all women who give birth annually have a prior C-section. And we have a gap, like we don't look at parity, or we, we only look at nullips, um, first time moms for our C-section measures, but we do need to come up with some better um, OB measures of safety that do take into account that, you know, women do have more than one baby and it would be interesting to see, you know, what, what that looks like down the line. I was just going to add, I think it's important to focus on preventing the first C-section, to your point. But that, you know, that, that being said, the rate of accreta goes up like this with a number of cesareans. So one is still a lot better than yes. two or three. So, so that weighs strongly. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, I think it came in from Cedar sinai um, What's the panel think of rega regarding uh, maternal requests for C-section, maternal request C-sections? I'll, I'll handle this as the, uh, the active obstetrician. Uh, you know, I, I get asked about this all the time, and, and I think we, we do have uh, an ethical obligation to offer that procedure, um, and, and you can get into arguments, you know, in a society where you can have plastic surgery, you, you probably have an ethical obligation to do that. But I can tell you that if, if you sit down and talk to patients and ask them why they want to do that, almost always they'll have some information that may not be factually correct. And if you just ask them what they're worried about and what their concerns are and ask their questions and educate them, 99% of the time they won't want to do it anymore. So this... Joe, you get the last word. Then. Oh, no. Only no, well, no, no. <laughs> well, we had talked earlier, and um, you would said that you thought that one of the reasons people choose natural childbirth is to have more control over the process. And uh, I think you're spot on. And I think that's why I don't think that, you know, the whole maternal request C-section, you know, I don't think it's a, a real debate. Um, because one of the stories, you know, for my second birth, I chose a birth center, freestanding birth center. And the stories that I actually related to more were the women who had a vaginal birth in a hospital the first time thought, I'm not going to do that again, and had an elective C-section. And I thought, that speaks more to me than seeking some ideal birth. It was more like, I'm not going to do that again. And so I actually don't think, I think there's room for that in our healthcare system. 
So unfortunately, we don't have any more time and we need to wrap up. Thank you guys so much for your answers. And uh, there's still a ton of things here. These guys uh, have promised me they're sticking around. So please grab us at the break and, and talk to us. And then I'll put a shameless plug for our workshop tomorrow on unnecessary C-section. Feel free to come in and uh, fill up the room and, and we'll talk more about these things. Thank you.